um, the, the coral reefs are very romantic and they can't, the coral animals, they, you know, they're stuck, they're glued down by their skeleton. So they can't move to go find like, you know, a mate to mate with. So what they do is to increase their chances of, of their eggs and their sperm meeting in the big wide open ocean, they use clocks. And the clocks that they use are the light of the moon and the temperature of the water and the light of the sun. And so um, every species has its own romantic timer that they use. Um, and even different reefs have their own timers, but usually it'll happen in August um, after the full moon, about between you know four to nine days after the full moon. Um, and then each species, like a certain number of hours after sunset, the corals will release their eggs and sperm in unison and down to the minute they will release their eggs and their sperm and, and they will float upwards, uh, hopefully, and they will meet near the surface of the water and fertilize each other and make the same, they make the same kind of little tic-tac larvae that the jellyfish do because they're very, like I said, first cousins and those little RV swim back down to the reef and find a promising spot to plant themselves for the rest of their life. And, and that's where the coral will grow. And we're, so muck, it's, we're mucking up that process too. Obviously if they can't reproduce. This is not good news. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some places in the Caribbean where the mm -hmm. corals live too far away from each other for their eggs and their sperm to meet with each other. So they're, one of the technologies that's happening is there are scientists and practitioners, reef practitioners who are collecting eggs and sperm. They go down, they dive. And I got to do this um, in the book and, and you go down at night Right? And you just kind of sit there like watching these coral colonies. And then all of a sudden these, these eggs just like, whoosh, they just emerge. And it's like, you're in a reverse blizzard or something. I mean, I guess it, it feels like a little indecent, but you know, it's just <laughs> also magical. And so lawyer, yeah, you're, a lawyer. <laughs> you're, you're surrounded by like, you know, reproductive material. So, but like, they just, they float up and it's just, it's like, whoa. And then, um, so scientists will collect these eggs and sperm, put them together in the lab, mix them up, turn them into, they larvae form. They have, they're developing these, um, these, these settling structures for the little larvae to swim down onto. And then they incubate them in these giant floating pools out in the ocean so that they can, some, some coral, the parents transfer the algae with them and some of some of them they have to get from the environment. So they put them in these big pools and they incubate them long enough, like coral kindergarten, long enough for them to kind of like make it on their own. And then they will replant thousands of baby coral to the sea at a time. So that's one of the amazing things that's happening out there in the world. And what else? Give us one or two more because I, I hear about these various things that are being tried like over the last 10 years at, you know, yeah. climate change conferences, but I haven't followed up to see if, which ones are working. Yeah. So the most impressive one I saw was really, um, undertaken by the Mars candy bar company, which is a little surprising, but it turns out they have, um, they have candy factories, you know, chocolate factories on tropical islands where there's coral reefs and where the people who work in their factories depend on the reef for additional income and for protein. Um, it's estimated that between half a billion and a billion people rely on coral reefs for their primary source of protein, um, which makes a ton of sense because they are such productive parts of our sea. Mm. So as the coral reef starts to decline, um, people who have traditionally relied on the reefs for this extra food, they, they are unable to. And so the Mar Frank Mars, who is the grandson of the original Mars, he noticed this and he was like, what can we do? And he started, he started working with some people in the factory who are really good at factory stuff. So they're very good at like tinkering and manufacturing and putting things together. And they came up with this idea, which um, the idea was for it to be portable, to be able to be made on any tropical island. So anywhere there's boat builders and it's a rebar sort of structure that has six arms on it and it's bent around. And um, 
and it, they call them reef stars. And they sort of just stabilize a reef that has become rubble. And you can tie coral fragments onto it. Reef stars get networked together into huge um, galaxies and they can put lay down thousands of coral in a, in a day. They can on these reef stars because each reef star holds 15 coral. It's mm. easy to do 100, 200, 500 at a time. And when you dive on these reefs 18 months later, you can hardly see the reef stars any longer. And I mean, just like the center of where these pieces of rebar come together, you'll see like a little star shape, but the coral overgrows it really well. And they really know what they're doing. They bump it up against a healthy reef. They even play the sounds of a healthy reef on their restorations. And that lures in these herbivores that help um, eat away at like macroalgae that may come in and outcompete the coral. And within three years, the reef, these restorations are magnificent. You can't tell that they were restored.